Hey guys, time for some art therapy. I made some clay yesterday for a client who is visually impaired and so we're doing 3D art and I thought it would be a great thing to introduce to everyone. I posted the recipe for the air dry clay and you can just make it with household. You probably all have this stuff in your kitchen, the cornstarch and baking soda. I always get the baking soda and baking powder mixed up and one time I tried to make it with the wrong thing it gets very very bubbly in the pot. So if it gets, starts getting really bubbly on you like fizzy bubbly take it off the heat dump it in the garbage and uh, start again with the other one. <laughs> I don't know if any of you ever have problems getting certain things mixed up in your head regularly but that's one of mine. Uh, anyway, so the clay is great. Like I said, it's uh, it's very clean on your hands. I really enjoyed kneading it as I was baking it. So you you mix your ingredients together. It's just three ingredients, cornstarch, soda, and water. And you mix it together to form a liquid. And then you put it in your saucepan. You put it on the burner over medium heat, medium, medium, low. Kind of gauge your own stove and stir it keep stirring it and eventually it starts to thicken and then you turn the heat off and you keep stirring it till it's pretty thick and then you put some cornstarch on your counter and dump it out of the saucepan let it cool a minute until it's good to touch and then it's it's really a nice sensation as you kind of fold it over into itself with some cornstarch until it's a good consistency and the temperature is very very nice i enjoyed playing with it it reminded me of when my mom was going to physical therapy for a wrist and when my grandma was going to pt for her hands and had to get play-doh and i was thinking that warm soft texture would have been really nice for them as well so lots of different ways to enjoy homemade air clay and just wrap it up tight made this yesterday if it starts to get a little too crumbly you might want to add a little water not too much otherwise it'll get real slow and if it's a little too wet you can add a little cornstarch so get it to the consistency you like if you like to have color you can also add color and let me just get an example of what happened when I added food coloring I made this around Easter time with my niece and we decided to add food coloring and when it dries it's pretty pastel -y in color this was made at Easter it lasts, it's probably not, you know, archival or gonna last forever, but it'll dry for you. You don't have to use an oven and put on a shelf. If you just wanna make the white, you could also let it dry and then add paint, but don't let the paint get too wet or soak into it too much. Cause again, that will reconstitute it cause it's just three simple ingredients. It's not commercial grade clay or anything, but very fun to play with. And you can create things and set them out. You could use toothpicks or sticks or anything that you want to add some texture in here. I had splurged and bought myself some clay tools a couple weeks ago to go with some encaustic painting supplies but anyway today I wanted to focus in on intense emotions and creating a volcano and I've got lots of fancy notes for you guys which I will flush out much prettier in the newsletter that I'll put out this week to go with this video but the reason I wanted to go with volcanoes well one it was fun because we have clay which can be 3d and it just seemed like the right thing to make a volcano of and the other reason I wanted to go with volcanoes is it's a super helpful analogy for talking about intense emotions especially anger I also found it ironic today that when I opened up my email I got an email from the five love languages I don't know if you guys have read that book but you can sign up for their emails and today's email with links and stuff was all about anger. Well, today must be the right day to deal with anger if I'm getting emails about anger. So play with the clay, enjoy the texture, and start creating a volcano. And volcanoes are basically mountains, right? So you could do it as simple as just creating some kind of a, of a mountain. You could go outside and grab, you know, parts of trees and stick them in I don't have any with me in here right now. Oh, I do have this leaf. So you could just stick the end of like a pine needle or a pine cone or any kind of branch and stick trees around it because volcanoes, when they're dormant, people live on them, they build homes on them. They're quite lovely places to be. It's just a mountain. And so you could decorate it. You could put little homes if you have Monopoly or Lego around or little toys. You could put little people depending on how much clay you have. You can make this mountain as elaborate as you want because when our intense emotions are under control, 
we can be quite lovely to be around, yes? But when they explode, you know, the top comes off, pieces go scattering, craters are left in the end, lava spews out, gases spew out, and lots of destruction can happen. But then once it's settled down, then you can, you know, things can start to, the crater's gonna be here, there's always gonna be this hill, but, and these rocks might form into something, but it can, new growth can come in. So that's the, the very quick synopsis of the volcano thing. And I've got lots of notes that I wanted to share with you here. One is volcanoes are kind of interesting. And two, there's lots of analogies you can draw with volcanoes and anger and anger management. And you don't have to have clay to do this activity. You can do this with toys. You can do this with drawing, however you'd like to do it. It's, it's nice with clay because you can keep manipulating it and transforming it, but you can also do that with drawing have several different drawings, have a cartoon strip kind of drawing. Uh, a couple things that I thought were super interesting about volcanoes, and I will link the full article in the newsletter, which you can sign up for at hopeandhealingathome.com or follow the link in my bio here today. The Earth's crust ranges from three to 37 miles thick. So the things that put pressure on the internal workings of a volcano that eventually lead to its eruption are really, really deep. And I think that's a great analogy for our emotions. Things are under the surface working and building. Things like resentment, hurt, bitterness, exhaustion, irritation, stress. None of these happen overnight to get from dormancy to explosion. They build, they build upon each other, they build on themselves. You know, hectic schedules, financial stress, lack of sleep, all of these things can contribute to our emotions, like the pressure inside building. And if we don't do something about that, eventually they erupt. Interesting things about volcanoes that can help continue this conversation of analogies and comparing and gaining insights by looking at something outside of ourselves like a volcano, is there's several different kinds of volcanoes. Some of them build up quickly over a couple months, others take years and years, and they develop over previous lava flows. So some of those lava flows are very gentle, and some of them are very violent when there's an explosion. And then the lava stays and it transforms the whole mountain. It can transform miles and miles of environment and human activity. With some of these eruptions, like Mount Etna killed 20,000 people in one day. There was another volcano that the eruption could be heard 3,000 miles away, and it dropped 70 pound boulders 50 miles away from the center of it. It caused a 130 foot tsunami that killed 36,000 people, and the dust caused the dust that went into the atmosphere from that one explosion caused the moon to appear blue or green for two years after the explosion talking about our intense emotions, particularly anger, is what happens? What's life like when it's building inside of us? And what happens when there's an explosion? What kind of damage takes place once we've had that full explosion? And then how do we repair that is a secondary part of looking at our anger. A couple other things that I was thinking about with anger in particular is how do, how do we manage it? Now there's the, again, there's like these two parts of managing it. One is the preemptive managing, like, how do we let off steam? How can we be intentional about letting off steam so that the pressure doesn't build to the full explosion, but it's more like a vent for steam or letting the lava ooze out. And that doesn't really destroy anything because everything can adjust as it's oozing. So there's that preemptive self-care and anger management, and then there's the after an explosion. Well, I guess there's one more step to the, the preemptive stuff too, is if we can start learning to read our bodies and maybe we can't, maybe it's not just a little ooze or a little vent of self-care. Maybe we need to know when to take those bigger steps of self-care. Like when we're super close, we can just like feel the earth trembling. We can feel our body tensing. Like we know this explosion is about to happen like within minutes. So we might need to take a little bit more of a drastic step and that might be walking away. That might be going and exercising or going and screaming in the car or singing at the top of our lungs. 
I've done some activities where we rip up paper when we're really angry or we pound nails into something. We do something really physical to get that intense energy out of us so that we can take control again of our bodies and our actions and our words and we can have calm thoughts again and answer questions like what actually caused me to feel this way? What do I need to communicate? What needs are going on within myself? Uh, one person commented on the Five Love Language article about how important it is to learn to relax so that clear thoughts can manifest. And I thought she said that pretty succinctly. Relax so clear thoughts can manifest. And this is in response to thinking about anger. How do we do that? What do we notice in ourselves that indicates that we need to take a break? Really important question to answer. And how do we let little bits of steam off so that we can stay at that? We can maintain a more calm look. Now anger is not bad. That's not what I'm trying to communicate. Anger is a really powerful emotion. It communicates a lot to us and it's important to be able to answer the questions that anger can point us to. Uh, anger can be a symbol or a symptom of or a signal of our boundaries being crossed, of something that we need to take care, care of, we need to take action on. But we don't want to do it when we're in that you know, explosive, angry, furious state because we'll probably you know, create some destruction if we take action in that moment. But if we can come to a calmer spot where we can articulate things well, our action can be really powerful. Our action can build things up. Our actions can be productive and even create a healthy environment. Some other things that we can think about when we're thinking of like anger management and taking proactive action, preemptive action before an explosion is what are we focused on? What's our mindset? Are we focused on what is not going well? Are we focused on what is going well? Are we focused on our to-do list? Or are we focused on making memories with the important people in our lives? This article I was reading talked a lot about parents and kids and how frustrating it can be when the kids aren't listening, the dogs aren't listening, the mess just keeps piling up around us. There's dishes to do and laundry to do. And then we have work calls and other responsibilities in life. And then our spouse comes in and we're like, Wah! They're even crabby today and we're just about to blow. And we can focus on all those things. Or we can say, hey, you know what? They're here. They're healthy. They're safe. Let's get outside. Let's blow some bubbles. Let's just leave the mess for a little bit and go do something fun and create a good memory. And then when we're feeling a little calmer, come back in and deal with one bit of this mess. We're not going to be able to take care of all the chaos at once, but maybe we can identify one step to help us feel a little bit more in control and that action is moving forward in a good way. Uh, sometimes anger can indicate old wounds or past trauma that need dealing with and maybe asking yourself, why am I so mad? What is the root of this? Maybe that indicates uh, that you need some extra support in some area of your life or you need to you know, go to counseling or talk with a good friend or work towards forgiveness. Maybe your sleep, sleep is off. So there's lots of things and I'm going to add some more questions in the newsletter about all of this to help us go deeper and really examine what our anger can teach us, what it's indicating about our lives, what things maybe need to change, and then how do we proactively take care of it so we don't explode and how do we make repairs after we have exploded? Because all of us are human. We're going to mess up and, and probably explode at some time. But going back to our volcano analogy, after an explosion and there's all of this destruction that's terrible, some really beautiful things can happen. Once the lava has emptied out and things cool down, a depression is left and lakes can form. Beautiful vistas um, can be seen. You can hike the mountain. The landscape can come back. It might look a little different, but new things can grow here. So just because we have an angry explosion does not mean that everything is broken. Healing can still take place. A restoration can take place. You can learn things about yourself after an explosion and you can model to people around you how to make those repairs and how to better your own self-care. So if you have any questions, let me know and please do share these if you think there's someone in your life that might benefit from this and enjoy making some clay for yourselves or kids or if you have clients that have some sensory issues or visual impairments sometimes this can be great because again there's this really nice texture for your hands and you can make something three-dimensional 
that they can then feel. It doesn't, they don't have to just see it. They can interact with it on a feeling, a tactile, sensory level that just helps us express in a different way. And there is, there's one caveat with any time if you're working with clients or someone who's experienced a lot of trauma, know that getting into something where you're manipulating it with your hands and it has this soft texture, sometimes that can trigger some regression. Just make sure you know who you're working with if you're gonna use this with clients or someone who's really struggling with things but it can also be very intentional to cause some regression as long as you know you can contain that with clients to helping them get back to some memories that need some healing that are too hard to access otherwise. So have fun, make some clay, enjoy it, keep it in an airtight you know, baggie or container if you're gonna have a couple days between using it because it will dry out and it dries out you know, hard. So you won't be able to manipulate it once it's dried out. Uh, and I would recommend not keeping it sealed up for more than a week because it may uh, start to mold even inside the bag. But it doesn't mold. When you just let it air dry, it won't mold up on you. Uh, and you can use any kind of clay materials. You can stick things into the clay. Once it's dried, you can paint it. You could probably seal it once that's all dried as well and have it last a little bit longer. If someone creates something that's very, very Thick. You may want to turn it over and take a toothpick and poke some holes in here so things can move as it dries or even like carve out from underneath so that it's a little bit thinner. If it's very thin, it might crack a little bit. If it's too thin or if you've put a thin piece next to a thick piece, they might pull away from each other. Enjoy it. Would love to see what anyone creates with clay. Have fun with it. And if you have any other questions for me about anger management or about any other emotion, would love to create a live or even a whole course around some things that you are wanting to learn more about, whether it's to use art with clients, uh, art with your own family, art for yourself, for personal development or processing traumas or learning more about your own emotions, strengths and struggles, uh, just for enjoyment. Let me know. All of those things I would love to know so that I can design these to be the biggest benefit for you. Also, I try to have a different guest each month on these lives. So if there's somebody that you'd like to hear more about, uh, let me know. I'll contact them and see if they're willing to do a live as well. Or if you would like to be a guest and share a part of your story of how art has been transformative in your life, that would be wonderful and welcome as well. So you guys have a great Wednesday and we'll talk to you again next week.